is the most unusual or the uh, funniest thing that you have ever seen happen at a wedding? You personally, I mean, what? The groom fell flat on his face. The groom fell flat on his face. Did the wedding go on? Yeah, it, once he cleared the cobwebs, yeah. Okay. Who's got something funny? Our girl dropped her petals and, and in the middle of the wedding, scooped down and picked up every last little petal. Every last petal <laughs> that she was dropping. Is, yeah, okay, I can understand. Kids want to pick those, yes. During photo session, the photographer said today's Tuesday and everyone took out a black piece of carpeting and put it on because my husband had such a large mustache. So the photo is everyone with a mustache but me. <laughs> That's good. That's quite good. Who else has a funny story from a wedding? There was a little boy who was um, in the wedding. Uh, uh, he's a ring bearer in front of the of the. Uh, Flower girl. No, the flower girl goes first and then the ring bear goes. And uh, so the flower girl was doing all the petal things and he was going down the aisle. And um, uh, he, he did, he started doing something that was a little bit unusual. He would walk for two steps and then he would turn to the groom's side and he'd do this. He'd go, Arrgh! <laughs> 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 and that was kind of weird to begin with. You know, and, then he, and then he'd walk two steps. And he turned to the bright side and he went, <laughs> He walked two more steps and, you know, by, by this time, you know, he's, he's going, and, and everyone's starting to laugh at him. And of course, he's a little guy and he's starting, and by the time he gets to the front, he's almost in tears himself because all the people are in tears laughing and he doesn't know why they're laughing at him. And, and then someone asked him after the wedding, what is, what were you doing when you were walking down the aisle behind the, the flower girl, and he said, I was being a ring bearer. Oh. <laughs> it's an English thing. If you, you have to have English as your first language, they're kind of with that one. But they got it. Very little. Um, I usually tell couples that they should expect that something crazy Goofy is going to happen at their wedding. It just, it just always seems like that. It, it, and I say, that, that's a part of the gift of the wedding. It makes it a memory, you, you know, that, that this is a wonderful thing. You know, is gonna, of course, they're all, they're all wound up at that part time anyway, and, and they're nervous, and then the zit appears, you know, that is just small, but it's huge in, in the perception, and, and that's the nature of it. Uh, a few months ago at Tom and Karen's wedding on the golf course outside of Prescott, about a half hour before the ceremony was starting, the, the wedding party was is still tucked away in the back, and so I don't think the bride even knows to this day that this happened. Does the bride know this happened? You saw it. Did you see it? Oh, the, the, the wind? The wind. Oh, yeah. The big wind came. I mean, and, and it, was, it was not just, it hadn't been windy out there. And suddenly this, this huge gust of wind came and it, it blew over all of the speakers that the uh, guitar players were using. I mean, these were huge speakers. It's kind of like you, you think um, someone would be killed if they come over and hit them with these. He, it blew these huge speakers over. And not only did it blow the huge speakers over, but it blew the wedding arch over. You know, the, uh, sitting in the front, they had an arch. And it was all elaborately decorated with flowers. It was gorgeous. And, and, and suddenly just went boom. And on top of that, they had put flower petals all along the, the runners and, and, and the walking areas. And so all of the flower petals went blowing across the golf course. And, and, or at least, uh, you know, almost out onto the golf course. And, and so we were all scrambling, picking up flower petals and putting them back in place and trying to get all the chairs lined up again and, and, and put the arch back up and put as many flowers back on it as possible. And, and the speakers went back up and everything worked. And, and, and as, did, did she ever figure that out, that that happened? Somebody probably told her later. But she, she you know, they were totally relaxed in the whole thing. And, and it, it just didn't, it, it didn't really seem to phase them. It was a great wedding, but, but weddings can become 
uh, and often are major stressors. I mean, we're working on this now for our daughter, you know, and there, you know, these stressful points of planning, yeah, it's just, it's too much. But um, for the officiant, uh, I like weddings. I, I don't stress out over them too much. I, I always have fun at weddings. Some weddings are more fun than others, but I always have fun at weddings, and I'm near, nearly always totally relaxed at weddings, maybe too relaxed for some weddings. But, but usually the groom and the bride are not all that relaxed at the wedding. The, the expectations, the stress is so high that, that many people have a really, really hard time enjoying themselves at their own wedding. And invariably some, something uh, small or large goes wrong to raise that stress level and to raise that tension up. At the wedding that Jesus went to, uh, that he attended in Cana, which is up north in Galilee with with his uh, disciples, uh, it, it was a rather large faux pas, rather large, major event happening that kind of invaded this wedding. It, it was a Jewish wedding, of course, and, and, and these weddings, you know, a Jewish wedding starts out with a big parade through town, and then they end up at the groom's front door, and they pick him up, you know, and, and, and then the, the actual ceremony takes place at the house. And, and then the new couple would, would form a parade through town again. I mean, we did this when, we used to do this all the time uh, growing up in, in California. I mean, I don't know if it was just a regional thing, but after the wedding, people would all get in their cars and they'd make a line and they'd start honking their horns and, you know, just married and drive through town and making a big noise and they would eventually end up at the reception. Well, this is kind of how they did, except they weren't blowing horns. And, I mean, they, you know, unless well, they had cow horns or something like that. And they would end up back at the house, and that's where the big feast would be. And um, it, it was a great banquet, and it went on for up to a week. A week of wedding banquet. You know, you said, when did they get to the cake? You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> the average American wedding, not counting the honeymoon, the average American wedding these days, I want to take a guess what it, how much it costs? About 30000 30000 15 15 mm -hmm. Depends on where you are. Yeah. That's yeah. right. If, if you are in New York City, $65,000. Okay. If you, the kind of, the, the whole of the United States is uh, 27000 So, I mean, you're pretty close to that 3000 you know, uh, $27,000 for a, a wedding. And, and that's just for the short version of the reception, right? You know, it's not a week-long reception. You can, you, when you think, a week of wedding reception. Oh, yeah. Wow. You, you think, the first thing that comes to my mind is, what would that tab look like? Where would you put that? Exactly. And, and what do you do between meals? I mean, maybe it's... The next one. Yeah. <laughs> where do you sleep? Where do they all sleep? Well, there, there are two things to keep in mind when, when you're discussing these weddings, these ancient Jewish weddings. You know, wedding practices evolve over time, but this is first century Jewish wedding. And, and um, the, the first thing to keep in mind is that the father... Uh, of the groom was responsible for paying for it. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it was a potluck. Everyone brought wine. And that, that was a part of the way of showing honor to the couple. And, and so when they ran out of wine at this wedding in Cana, it, it, it was a major embarrassment, not just for the father of the groom, but it was an embarrassment for the entire community, for, for they had not provided enough. The, the community had not been generous enough. Well, you know what happens, right? Jesus' mother, Mary, notices that there's some stirring behind the scenes. And uh, for some reason or another, she seems to think that Jesus might be able to do something. But, but it's not clear what she's thinking that he might be able to do. R remember, there is no biblical record uh, of Jesus performing miracles prior to this point. 
So perhaps uh, she thought, well, maybe he can get in his Beamer and, and drive down to Circle K and pick up a few more bottles or something. You know, we, we don't know what was going on exactly in, in, in our mind or ideas, but uh, you know, if you look at verse 3 in uh, John 2, uh, when the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, they don't have any wine. Jesus replied, verse 4, woman, what does that have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. Now, in some translations, it, it almost sounds like Jesus is being curt and rude with his mother, woman. But, 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 but the language here is actually more formal than it is rude. Mary was wondering if Jesus might be in a position to be able to do something. Then Jesus adds, and, and this is significant because this is a phrase that will pop up again and again in, in the Gospel of John. Uh, Jesus says, my time, or, or more literally, my hour, hasn't come yet. Right? In, in John, my time, or, or Jesus' time, is a phrase that refers to the, the pinnacle of Jesus' earthly ministry. For example, if you look in John 13, verse 1, uh, before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his time, his hour, uh, had come to leave this world and go to the Father. His time, his hour, uh, is Jesus' moment of glory, when he would intentionally lay down his life as a sacrifice for all of humanity. So, so in John 2, when Jesus tells his mother that his time hadn't come yet, he is interpreting her question to mean, isn't it time when you rise up and that you assume your position? You assume your position of power, whatever that is. In, in other words, son, show, show them what you've got. But Jesus says it's not that time yet. It's not the hour. Still he responds to his mother. He, he, he does not blow her off. And verse 5, his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. And then it says, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing. And, and John throws in all this detail in here, uh, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Now you can do the math. That's potentially what? 120 to 180 gallons. 180 gallons. 180 gallons of liquid. Now you think if you buy a gallon of milk and it fits in the door of your refrigerator, and then think if I had 180 of those, <laughs> you need a bigger fridge. You need a bigger fridge. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and these were not normal clay utility jars that, that, you know, would typically in the routine of life get contaminated and then what they would do is they'd break them, they'd destroy them. Uh, these were the stone jars. These were the high-end jars. They were stone jars uh, as was prescribed by rabbinic law and, and, when the, and they were to be used exclusively for purification washings. That is, until Jesus came along and, and messed that up. But that's, just hold that idea, uh, because it will be important in a minute. Verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, Now draw some from them, and take it to the head waiter. And they did. And then he told them, Now draw some... Why am I repeating that? And then verse 9, The head waiter tasted the water that had become wine, and he did not know where it had come from. But he knew it wasn't from Circle K. <laughs> Though the servants had drawn the water, he had known that they had drawn the water. The head waiter called the groom and said, Everyone serves the good wine first, and they bring out the second-rate wine only when the guests are freely drinking. You kept the good wine until now. That is, after everyone has been a little schlockered, you know, has been drinking wine for two or three days, you know, you, 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 let, let's just say that their palates are no longer as um, fastidious. And by the way, the text does not say that, or intend to say that they were drunk. Drunkenness was socially unacceptable even then, 
even at five day long weddings. <laughs> so, you know, people had to kind of pace, they figured out how to do that. But, but if you've been enjoying wine for several days, you are not nearly as discriminating as you were on the first day. And, and, and that's when people would, would normally bring out the uh, least expensive vino on um, second, third day, you know. But this, the, the wine that Jesus had just made, isn't the cheapo stuff. This is, this is good. <coughs> this is great wine. When God makes wine, He does it right. He doesn't mess around. And in a nutshell, that's the story. And, and usually we read this and, and we think, well, how wonderful it is that, that Jesus used his divine power to help out somebody in, in, in an embarrassing situation. It, you know, that reveals that, uh, that Jesus is powerful and that Jesus is thoughtful and Jesus is helpful. Thus, as his followers, uh, we should be thoughtful and we should be helpful using whatever gifts or power that we have at hand in order to, you know, to, to make things better. And I've read a lot of sermons on this text and, and usually it ends up somewhere along the, in, in that territory. But as I look at this passage, I think that's missing at least part of the point. Or this story is more complex and it's more sophisticated than it appears at first reading. <coughs> now, don't, mis don't mishear me. We can trust Christ with our common problems. If you're using the message guide, that's number one. We can trust Christ with our common problems. Uh, for us, um, as 21st century Americans, uh, wine lies in the realm of the suave and, and the refined. Wine is about connoisseurs. And of course... Wine snobs. Ordinary people drink beer. You know, people that are more sophisticated drink wine. And, you know, you, there's a certain way that you have to do it in, in, in order to be able to, to appear in public drinking this stuff. So, you, you know that red wine is always served at 65 degrees. You know that, right? <laughs> And, and white wine, of course, is always served at 45 degrees. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, or else you're... You wouldn't have it any other way. You wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, that's exactly. I mean, that's just normal for us. We understand those things. And, 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 and then you have to learn how to, to, to subtly sniff the wine as it, you know... Yeah, I mean, that's part of the show. You know, I mean, there's this, whole, there's this whole separate wine subculture in our society. But first century Jews in, in Cana of Galilee did not think of wine in quite the same way. For them, wine was ordinary. Wine was life. Wine was necessary. And, and it's important to realize that, that Jesus was involved in mundane issues. And that they were important enough for his intervention. And, and, and there are times when, when we run out of wine, in, in spite of our great planning, in, in spite of all of the energy we put into keeping things going, we sometimes still come up short. It happens. The house payment isn't there. The, the milk money isn't in the jar. The job suddenly, poof, evaporates. And it's definitely appropriate to ask Jesus to do something. I mean, isn't this the essence of the line in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught to his first followers? Give us today our daily bread. Mundane, basic, ordinary life issues. Ask, God will provide, perhaps not in the way that you expect him to provide, and perhaps not in the timing you expect, uh, or, or, or in the way that you think that you deserve. <laughs> but he will provide. We can trust Christ with our common problem. But, but the significance of the got wine story in John 2 goes way beyond this. And, and really has more to do with the why or the because. That is, um, the reasons which we can come to Christ are. 
you know, we, we, we can trust Christ with our common problems because, and, and this is number two on the message guide, uh, because the sign shows that the new age has begun. The sign shows that the new age has begun. This is why uh, uh, the chapter, John 2, uh, verse 1, begins on the third day. On the third day. Third day is more than a time marker. It is a statement of significance. Perhaps it wasn't yet Jesus' hour. It wasn't his time as he reported to his mother. But it was a part of the third day movement that was starting to occur with, with the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Which is what this marks, the beginning of Jesus' ministry the day before he just gathered these disciples together and, and now they're moving out. So consider, if you look at John 20, uh, verse 1, early in the morning on, of the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that a stone had been taken away from the tomb. The first day of the week was the third day after the crucifixion. The third day is the day of the resurrection. It, it, it's The third day is the day of new beginnings. It, it's the new era where, where, where death and decay and, and wine shortages are no longer calling the shots or are no longer defining life. And, and it's clear that John is speaking somewhat symbolically here when he says that it was the third day because... If you back into this, if you follow the time markers in chapter 1, leading into chapter 2, remember the markers didn't really show up in here until, you know, the, the 1500s AD. Uh, if you follow the time markers in chapter 1, you would see that it was literally the fourth day. Now, if you count all the references today, it's the seventh day, but that's... But if you count if the sequence, the episode there, it, this is literally the fourth day in this episode of, of, of story. And yet it is, says, on the third day. Huh. And, and, and the wedding story is, is very nuanced. John uh, tells it in such a way that the sophisticated first century reader, and remember that, that John is writing to a thinking audience. This is the thinking person's gospel. Not that the others are for dummies, but this is really kind of the, you know, the top tier, you know, in terms of philosophical thought woven into... This is, this is the thinking person's gospel, and the, the very sophisticated first and, and second century reader, they would have, they would have likely picked up on, on a few things that we don't readily see as we look at the gospels. Uh, note, first of all, that this takes place at a wedding banquet. In, in, in Jewish literature of the first century, when, when Jews thought about what heaven was like and what the coming of the Messiah was like, they thought in terms of a banquet, a celebratory feast. And, and to them, the wedding banquet was the closest thing that you could come to that, that was the feast of the new age. If you wanted a metaphor for what this feast is going to be, it's the wedding banquet and then blown up and glorified. That, that was the mark of the new era. That was the mark of the new age that Jesus was starting. And, and, and the reasons why the wedding feast was so, um, so, so natural of a, an illustration is that it was protracted. It went on and on. You know, a week of party. And it was usually pretty carefree, unless you run out of wine. <laughs> and, and, and there was unlimited food, and there was unlimited drink. And it marked the beginning of a new couple's life together, a, a new era with hope for the future, not just for that couple, not just for that couple's family, but for the entire community. It meant that there were going to be children, and there were going to be grandchildren. So for these people, the wedding feast what was a prototype of the heavenly feast. And, and, and it's no accident that Jesus first reveals himself in this way at such a feast. It, it's a very pregnant setting. And, and then there's also that issue of the stone jars. These are jars whose sole function 
was to help people keep the rabbinical rules about washing and outward purification. When Jews eat a meal, at least in the first century, they wouldn't just wash their hands before the meal. You know, you send your kid, go wash your hands, we're about to eat supper. Yeah, they didn't just wash before the meal. But to remain ceremonially clean, they also washed between each course of the meal as well. There were multiple washings in the feast. However, what happens in this story, in John 2, means that, that this water and these jars originally set aside for purification rites, as John, it's mentioned in there, these are the kind that are used for the purification rites, for, for hand washing, they were no longer available for purification purposes because the content of the, the jars had been replaced by something new, by wine. So how are all these people going to be washing their hands between each serving? With Jesus present, ritual purification is no longer necessary. The old rabbinical rules have become outdated. They've been replaced by something new. They've been replaced by something better. Water has been replaced by wine. The ceremonial law has been superseded by the substance of joy. And I don't think I'm stretching things too much to read this in here. Uh, this sign shows that Jesus, Jesus' new age has begun, and, and this is evidenced in, in the glory of Christ being revealed, the basis for our faith. Number three. The glory of Christ being revealed, the basis for faith. Uh, jump down to verse 11 if you've got your Bibles open. This was the first miraculous sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. The, the word for sign here is different than the word for miracles that's used in the other Gospels. Miracles tend to be about shock and awe. Do you remember that phrase from, what was it, the Gulf War I? <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're going to get them a shock and awe. Well, that's kind of that's kind of what miracles were about. It's, it's shocking people and having them awe, get, get, getting their attention. But, but, but signs are more directly revelatory. Uh, Dr. Gary Berg, who uh, teaches New Testament at Wheaton College, he, he, he is a brilliant yet a very down-to-earth man. And, and Gary says, a sign is revelatory. Disclosing th something about God hidden before. The signs are not merely acts of power and might. They unveil that God is at work in Jesus and indeed is present in it. Thus, John remarks that through this sign, Jesus reveals his glory. Epiphany. This is, Gary writes, this is an essential affirmation for John and it moves to the center of what he affirms about Jesus. Jesus is not merely a man. He is more. He conveys the presence of God in the world. And since he radiates the presence of God, he appropriately shows forth God's glory. And the disciples got it. Even early on. I mean, the disciples, you know, sometimes you wonder about them. But right here, you're saying, I'm, the disciples get it. Verse, the second half of verse 11, uh, 11b, he revealed his glory and his disciples <laughs> believed in him. His disciples believed in him. By the way, this is a phrase that pops up in the Gospel of John over and over again as well. Um, Jesus does a sign and then John notes that someone believes or puts their faith in him. That is, they, they understand who he is because of the sign, and then they start to trust him. The Gospel of John is an apologetic. The, the point is to get people to see who Jesus is, and then to put their faith in him. Not, not just for the ordinary and mundane problems of life, uh, 
but for purpose and for meaning in life. And, and as John will ultimately reveal for eternal life. Uh, a few years back, somebody put together a uh, roadside billboard campaign. And, and there was a, a clear, um, there was clear water running out of this big spigot. I mean, the sign was pretty simple. It just had a big spigot, and, and there was water running out of it, and, and it was pouring into a huge uh, wine glass. And by the time that the water had come, moved from the spigot to the wine glass, it, it was obviously wine. And, and there was nothing else on the billboard except the question, got wine? It was to get people thinking. Mm -hmm. Huh? Mm -hmm. What's this about? Where did it got, yeah, got wine? And, and Jesus is challenging us with the very same question. Got wine? Do you get it? Do um, you see who Jesus is? Are, are you again going to put your trust in him today? As before. As in the future. Is today, will, will you put your trust in him? Do you have wine? Got wine.